So good morning, everybody. I am so, again, I just want to uh, apologize to you. We felt like this was the best thing that we could do was to go ahead and shut down the building for the next two weeks because we have so many people who have been impacted this week by COVID-19. And in reality, no one got it from here at the church. Uh, no one picked it up from anyone that was here. It's all been external, but we felt like it was the safest thing and the wisest thing for us to do would be to go ahead and cut it down for two weeks, give it all time to go away and then reopen again or re-reopen, however you want to want to call it. But uh, so for the next two weeks, we'll be doing this. Uh, we'll have a message on Sunday mornings. And uh, we'll have messages on Wednesday nights. I don't want you guys to get bummed. Uh, I want you to engage these messages. So please watch them and uh, comment, 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 share, and do all of those things that we were doing previously. Let's do it again. Uh, let's get the word out. Invite people to come back to our reopening and uh, really be an encouragement to one another to be a part of what God is doing here. And so I uh, just wanted to reiterate, uh, this is only for the next two weeks. Uh, and so after that, we will be back in here with, with everyone in full swing. And it's going to be a great, great time together with you. And so this morning, uh, I know it is Sunday morning, so this morning I want to... Uh, share with you a message called Stagger Proofing Your Faith. Stagger Proofing Your Faith. And I'm actually going to preach from Romans chapter 4, which is a chapter that we've been studying, uh, in fact, this past Friday, or excuse me, Wednesday. I would love for you guys to come on Wednesdays when we reopen. I would love for you to log in to your Facebook uh, we'll be on either my page for, for the uh, Wednesday nights or we'll be on the church page for Wednesday nights. Uh, not really sure on that, but I would love for you to log in on the pages and watch and come, come along with us on the journey through the letter to the Romans. We've been having a good time with it and I look forward to sharing my thoughts with you uh, this week on Romans chapter 5, possibly chapter 6. You'll be getting an announcement about that in the coming days. So I love you guys, and let's jump in to the message this morning. Uh, and, and I want you to realize this. We're living in a crazy time. We're weeks before the biggest vote, probably in the history of our nation. Uh, at least right now, it feels that way. We're in turmoil. We're in upheaval. Uh, we've got... Uh, Every life is mattering, black lives matter, white lives matter, babies' lives matter, you name it. All of this is circulating, and our nation is in a very precarious place. And, and I want you to understand that unbelief and fear, which is what we're seeing on television, we're hearing it through the media, we're hearing it from our friends, we're hearing it from people who say they have truth and don't have truth, people who uh, think they don't have truth, that maybe they do have truth. There's so much uncertainty that is circulating around our country, that is circulating around our, uh, uh, our heads, uh, and it just keeps on compounding. And my belief is this, is that unbelief and fear breeds doubt. Uh, and, and that is what causes faith to stagger. When faith doubts, or when there is doubt, faith staggers. And we need to stagger proof our faith in the same manner as our father Abraham did. And no, I'm, this is not going to be a Jewish teaching for you. Uh, this is really a believer thing. I want you to understand the book of Romans, the letter to the Romans, lines out very precisely that Abraham is our father of faith as much as he is the father of Israel. He is our father of faith in the same way. And so when I say our father Abraham, I'm not talking uh, about the song, about, you know, and, and I'm, not, I'm not talking about um, a Jewish tradition. I am talking about biblical fact. 
Abraham is our father in the faith and we need to stagger proof our faith in the same way that he did. So we're going to learn to pattern our faith in the same manner as he did. And while Abraham is our father of faith, let me say this right at the beginning. Jesus, however, is the author and the finisher of our faith. And that is something that I'm going to go into. So as much as Abraham is our father, Jesus is the author and the finisher. The father's very important, but the author and the finisher are way above him. And so Jesus is our author and finisher of our faith, which we have received through our father, Abraham. And so we're going to go to Romans chapter 4 and read verses 13 through 21. I'm not going to be able to post it up on the screen for you this week. We'll work on maybe doing that next week. But this week for right now, just go along with me. I'm reading out of the English Standard Version this morning. <coughs> Excuse me. Verse 13. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who was the father of us all. I told you he was our father. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. In hope, he believed against hope, talking about Abraham that he should become the father of many nations as he had been told. So shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No, unbelief, no unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. We're going to talk about stagger proofing our faith. And so we start off, number one, I want you to follow along with me here. Faith is the gateway of grace. It is the gateway of grace. It opens the door to grace. Verse 16, he says, Again, that is why it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring. Listen, the place of belief, that place of faith in our lives is the gateway that opens up for us to receive grace. It opens us to receive the empowerment now, let me define grace real quick. The empowerment to accomplish what we could not in our own power accomplish. Listen, grace is not a covering. That's forgiveness. Grace is a power to overcome. Grace is so much more than just a washing, coupling with forgiveness, coupling with mercy. Listen, when we go to the throne of God for mercy. Guess what we find there? Not just mercy, but we also find grace. And so you got to understand this. Grace is not just a simple cover-up. It's not a simple covering. It is empowerment to overcome. And faith is the gateway to the empowerment to overcome. Paul says here that faith is this conduit by which the promise of God rests upon grace. In other words, grace is the foundation. Through faith, grace becomes the foundation for the promise to become realized in our life. 
It is built on grace. And it is the realization that in order to overcome any and all situations, we must have grace in our lives moving us forward. What do I mean by that? Well, what I'm saying is in every situation, I'm not just talking gospel and promise because, uh, and I'll get into that in just a second, but in every situation that we come across, especially the ones we're talking about right now, in every situation that we come across, we are going to need grace because we are going to need to overcome. We are overcomers. I want you to look at your neighbor. I want you to look at your husband, your wife, your kids. And I want you to look them in the eye and say, you are an overcomer. And God has empowered you to overcome by his grace through the gateway of faith according to the promise that we have been promised. Listen, if we're going to make it in these last days... We definitely need to understand the promise that we have received. You see, the promise that we have received is not just simply the prophetic words that we get. Uh, the promise that we received, and it's, it really kind of leads me into, the, into point number two for us, is this, that faith must begin and end in Jesus. So number two, faith must begin and end in Jesus. What am I saying? The promise that we receive... By faith that rests on grace is that Jesus came, lived, died, rose again, and is seated at the right hand of the Father making intercession for me and you. Well, let me expand that for just a second so that we understand it just a little bit more. Listen, Jesus came for you. That's right, you. He came for you. He came for me. He came. He died. His blood has covered our sin, covered sin, that which separated us from God himself. When Adam and Eve fell, sin entered the world and there needed to be sacrifice for sin. Jesus came into the world as the perfect sacrifice and his blood has settled the argument regarding sin. Sin has been defeated in our lives because of the blood of Jesus that he shed on the cross for me and for you. And so the promise that we have received is Jesus, that he has come into our lives, that he is washing us and he is cleansing us. He is our Lord. He is our Savior. He is my King, my Lord, my God. And, and we were given this promise all throughout the Old Testament. So Paul is making a reference here to the Old Testament promise that there's coming a deliverer, that there's coming a Messiah who would not just deliver Israel, but would deliver all of mankind, that he would be led like a sheep to slaughter, that he would not open his mouth and say a word, that God would be his defense, that he would even rise on the third day. And so we, we have this promise, this huge promise for us, this guarantee that our sin has been covered by the blood of Jesus and this guarantee of everlasting life through the resurrection of Jesus by the power of God when he rose from the dead. And so for us, this promise is huge. Now, let me, let me tell you, if, if you're having trouble with this promise, you need grace. Because the enemy's coming in. And the first thing he's wanting to do is he wants to steal your understanding that you've been saved. He wants to steal your hope that we don't just die, that death is not the end. Death is literally the end of a chapter and Eternity is the next page that opens up for us through the resurrection of Jesus to be eternally living, ruling, and reigning with Jesus. So our promise and what the enemy comes in to take away from us is that we're saved and is that we have this guarantee, this blessed hope that we have received through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so, listen, the very first thing we've got to realize in this place of dealing with faith as a gateway is receiving this promise. As I said, faith must begin and end in 
Jesus. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 says that Jesus, I already said it once, but now understand it again. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. He is the one who birthed faith into us through his Holy Spirit, and is the one who knows how to complete that faith. This means that Jesus is the one, the only one, that we can trust in all matters of faith. Listen, if you don't get this principle down first, that Jesus is the foundation of faith, that he is the author of your faith, that he is the completer of your faith, and, and if you don't walk in a place of trusting him in faith, listen, you're going to have a hard time making it in the next few moments of this world, which is, is very quickly moving uh, from decline into destruction. Listen, uh, I'm telling you right now, the scripture is true and clear. We are in the perilous times that Jesus said would come. We are in the place of nations and mindsets rising up against one another. We're seeing wonders in the heavens above and in the earth beneath. We're seeing all manner of crazy thing that Jesus said would go on in the end of days. So uh, I'm telling you right now, if you can't get this basic principle right now, you're going to have a hard time having victory in the days to come. I'm not just talking about the prophecies that we have heard of, of, of the great things that God plans to do or the, or the prophecies that we have heard and the dreams that we have heard from, uh, from pastors of the devastation that's coming at the end of this election. Look, whether that is all political or whether it's not political at all and it is truly prophetic word, I know this, that in times where darkness begins to rise up, the church needs more and more grace to rely upon the promise being fulfilled in our lives so that we have that confidence on, as we move through the next days in our life. Listen, you can't walk in faith without Jesus being the first promise that you receive. In fact, Jesus is the promise that rests on grace. He's the greatest promise you will ever receive ever, let me say this to you, look into my eye, ever receive. All the prophetic words, all the promises, all the rhema words, the word of the Lord that is given to you where it just jumps out of the, uh, off the page as you're studying the word of God, all of those things come through Jesus. If you haven't figured it out, it's not the New Testament that talks about Jesus alone. The Old Testament talks about Jesus as well. He is on every page, just about every page in Scripture is full of Jesus. He's the author and finisher of our faith. He's the beginning and the end. He's the first and the last. He's the first among many brethren. You could, listen, you could read all of the New Testament and understand the Old Testament as it was talking about Jesus, our Messiah, Jesus, our deliverer, Jesus, my Savior, Jesus, the foundation upon which all promises, prophetic words, rhema words, everything is founded upon Jesus. 1 Corinthians 1.20, the first part of that, we'll call it A if you want to, says all the promises of God are in Jesus, yes. That's not a woohoo-hoo. That's not a touchdown yes. That is uh, not a yes that, and listen to this, this yes doesn't mean that you can have permission to have that promise. Listen, when my kids ask me, uh, if they can do something and I say yes, it is always permission. This is not permission after the fact. This is before you even ask, the, through Jesus, the word is yes. Before you even ask, through Jesus, the promise is yes. That means you don't have to ask to receive a promise. You just have to receive the promise because yes has already been attached to it. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you go through here, if you receive prophetic word, rhema word, word from the Lord, the promises that are contained in scripture, listen, yes 
is preemptive. Yes comes before you even ask. Every one of these promises through Jesus is automatically yes. Yes. Say it to yourself. Say, self, yes. What am I saying? You don't need permission to grab. You just grab. You don't need permission to do. You walk in the affirmation of yes. Mm, that's good stuff. But let's finish the verse because it also says this. So that through him, again, Jesus... So now through him, the promise is yes. And now through Jesus, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Do you know how you follow through in receiving a promise? Amen. 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 However you want to say it, with whatever accent you want to say it, amen. The amen does not come from God. It comes from us. When you grab the promise, the amen, which means so be it, comes from your mouth. It doesn't come from God's mouth. He doesn't have to say so be it to something he's already said is to happen. He doesn't have to so be a promise that he's already said you can have. All you have to do is know that Jesus said yes, and through Jesus the Father says yes, and you simply say, so be it, and you walk in that so be it. And it's all for the glory of God. The promise comes through Jesus. The response comes through Jesus. The connecting point between the promise, the promiser, and the promisee is Jesus. That's right, you heard it. The promise is Jesus. And the promise flows through Jesus. Jesus is the connection between God who spoke the promise, yes. And between us, the promisee, who says, amen. Jesus is in all of that. He's everywhere. And if we can get our faith focused on Jesus, the author and completer of our faith, walking with him according to grace as the promise rests on grace, is built on grace and grace empowers. If we will do this, if we will live our lives in this manner, listen, your faith will become stagger proof because you're no longer looking with your eyes physically. You're no longer looking with your senses to try and understand the situation. You're trusting the God who saw your situation before you were ever born. And when he made a promise and he said yes to that promise, Jesus being a part of that promise, being that promise, when he said yes, you said amen. And now you walk according to the amen. The amen is simply the agreement, the lining up with what the promise already is. Now, last, and this is where I, I think that we get to the, okay, yeah, but how? That's great, Pastor, but how? How do we do this? How, how do we stagger-proof our faith? You've, you've told us uh, the mindset we've got to have for it. You've told us kind of a response for it, but there's, there's more to the response, I'm sure, because what else do we have to do? It can't be just that easy to say, amen. Well, you're right. It can't be just that easy to say, amen, though it is that easy to say, amen. Men. But there's one other thing. There's one more part out of this passage of scripture that I want you to understand. And that is this. Faith is glory to God. Faith is glory to God. Watch this in verse 20. No unbelief made him waver. Talking about Abraham. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong in his faith as he gave Glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Now let's roll back the clock, go back to the days of Abraham. You know in the stories of, of Genesis that uh, God spoke to Abraham and said, you're going to have a son. And uh, Abraham says, how am I supposed to have a son? Uh, you know, I... I'm too old. My wife, look at her. She's beyond childbearing age. And, and God said, no, I'm telling you, you will have a son. 
just believe. You will have a son. I'm giving you a son. Promise a son. And, and so Abraham, the Bible says that Abraham said, okay, I believe you. Well, we know the story that later on he, 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 uh, he got caught up with Hagar. Uh, Sarah was like, you know, I'm too old and, and this just can't, you know, she put it on herself to be the fulfillment of the promise instead of just believing God with her amen. She, she trusted herself in that promise and she ended up making a flesh move. And Abraham has, uh, has relationship with Hagar and Hagar gives birth to a child, but this child is not the promised child. This child is a child of flesh and circumvention trying to get around the fulfillment of God's promise in God's timing. And so God had to come back and say, whoa, 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 I told you, you're going to have a son. You are going to have a son. And we know, long story short, all of a sudden, one year after uh, the reiteration of the promise to Abraham, Sarah, lo and behold, is pregnant and has a child, and they name him Isaac. And we know uh, that as they were growing up, uh, as Isaac is growing up, comes the day for Abraham uh, to worship God. And God says, hey, take your son and sacrifice him to me in a place where I'm going to show you. And so he, he packs all of their stuff up. And you know the, the story. He goes uh, to, with a couple of servants and, and he's got all of the things that he needs. And, and he, uh, he tells his servants, stay here. We're going to go up to that mountain. We're going to worship God and we're going to come back. And Isaac says to him, uh, Dad, you, you know, I see that you've got the wood and, and, and even the fire, and, but um, uh, where's, where's the sacrifice? And Abraham says, God will provide for himself a lamb. And so, you know, just as Abraham was fixing to plunge his knife into uh, Isaac, the angel tells him to stop declares that the Father God sees his faithfulness and made provision by putting a ram's, uh, ram with his horn stuck in a, uh, in a bush or in a thicket. And so Abraham's able to go over there, slaughter the ram and sacrifice the ram in praise. And again, more promise comes from that because then God says, I'm making you a father of many nations and you will be called Abraham. And so we know what a great story, right? I mean, that's just an amazing story. And it is from this story that we get the concepts of stagger proofing our faith. And so uh, this verse says that Abraham grew strong in faith as he gave glory to God. This isn't after the process, but before its completion and while it is being completed. L listen, glory to God. And what I'm talking about when I say he gave glory to God, it it's not just simply shouting glory to God or saying glory uh, or, or even declaring we give you glory or singing about giving God glory. Uh, in fact, how does one give glory? He reflects it. The word glory by definition means to reflect and for that is uh, for for this meaning here of glory to reflect God's glory uh, in this way means to fully believe in His word, fully commit myself to His promise, let my amen be coupled with His yes, and here's how I live out that giving glory to God. It is the constant declaration of amen. Pastor, that sounds ridiculous. Are you saying we should just walk around all the time going amen? Not necessarily. That's not what I'm talking about, but that's probably a good start for some of us. We should probably uh, put amens in our sentences and say amen in our life uh, more often than at the end of prayer at the table for dinner or, uh, or a sporting event or, or at the end of a Sunday service or a Wednesday night teaching. Uh, so amen's a little more than this. Uh, so, so the so be it the has to be spoken. See, he says this in that it, he, he gave glory to God uh, and it must be spoken. Amen is to be spoken. Said implies spoken. The so be it is not a rubber stamp punctuation on a thought. It is the declaration of the thought. 
as it comes from the Father through Jesus by the Spirit of God. And so let's go back to the example of Abraham. What does it look like to stagger proof your faith? What does it mean to let your amen give God glory? It means in every circumstance you begin to speak the promise that you've been given. It, me it means that in every circumstance you begin to speak the word of the Lord. It means that in every circumstance you begin to say mirroring, because that's what reflection is. It is a mirror. You begin to mirror God's faith. You begin to mirror God's word by speaking the word that he has given. Every prophecy, every promise, every word that you have received through the rhema word of God, every one of those things, if you will take just a moment... In your day, when circumstance comes at you, when situation comes at you, and have having written down the promise of God, keep it right there in your face so that when stuff comes at you and it's trying to take that promise, it's trying to remove that hope, then all of a sudden you say, no, 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 no. Situation, hear the word of the Lord. Amen, thus saith the Lord. So be it, this is what the Lord says. And this is what I'm going to think. And this is how I'm going to live. So be it when everybody was coming and having heard the story that God spoke to Abraham that he was going to have a child and they came to him and said hey man don't you know that your your wife's way too stinking old to have a kid he says no 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 thus saith the Lord you shall have a son I'm going to have a son my son is coming I can even see moments with even before Sarah was pregnant that Abraham would rub the belly as if it was pregnant and speak to the child that wasn't even there yet because the Bible says here in Romans that God is the one who gives life to the dead speaking of the womb of Sarah and calls into existence things that do not exist in other words listen I know people have preached for years that you can speak things Things into existence let me tell you something you can only speak into existence what God has already spoken you don't you don't get to just dictate to God the things that go on in your life and how that situation comes but you can get the word of the Lord and begin to speak forth what God sees and how God sees so that in your situation you are joining and mirroring in his glory through your amen, through declaring the word of the Lord in a situation, speaking those things that are not as though they are, things that don't exist into existence because God has already spoken them into existence. Like I said, I can see Sarah laying there and Abraham coming up and rubbing the belly and speaking Speaking to Isaac, he knew he was going to name him Isaac, speaking to Isaac, calling forth things in his life and, and just speaking life into Isaac. I could see it. I, I could see every time that he was told that he was told by people around him, there is no way. It's just not possible. The word of the Lord, the Lord says, the Lord says, I'm going to be a father of many nations. You don't even have a kid. The Lord said, I'm going to have a kid. I am holding on to this promise, believing that God is able to do what he said he would do. And if I will follow that faith, listen, if I will believe that God is able to deliver because he said he'll deliver, if I believe that God is able to rescue because he said he can rescue, if I believe that God is able to save because he saved me, he saved you. If I believe these things about God, that he is able to perform what he said he would do, then I'm simply repeating in amen structures the things that God has already said, that he has already promised, that he has already made. And so for me and you, how do you stagger proof? You begin to speak the word of the Lord into your situation. You begin to speak the word of the Lord into that, into that issue over your children, over your spouse, over your job, over your church, over your community, over the situations that you see. Not from a political perspective of declaring who you think and what you think, but hearing the word of the Lord and speaking forth the word of the Lord. The Old Testament prophets didn't get to uh, uh, evangelistically speak upon the words that they were given. They were to declare the word of the Lord and they were to go 
from that point forward, believing that the word of the Lord had been spoken, that it was done, it was already going to happen. And so in the same way for us, speaking prophetically, grabbing the promise, understanding the rhema word that you receive, declare those things, even when the situation doesn't look like it, even when the situation looks hopeless, even when it seems like the circumstances are completely against you, speak the word of the Lord. We've got to have stagger proof faith in this day and time. We've got to stagger proof our faith by letting our amen line up with his yes. That's the how. That's the why. God is not a son of man that he should lie. Boy, that's enough for us to understand that his ways are above our ways because he's not a man. He doesn't lie. He doesn't change his mind about what he has promised. Listen, when it comes down to Jesus and salvation, he's promised salvation for us through Jesus Christ. There is none other. There is no other way. Everything else is unrighteousness, but Jesus himself, he is the righteous way to a righteous God. And when we believe and receive the promise of Jesus in our hearts, we become righteous according to the righteousness of God. And so for us today, that first promise is to, gra to grab a hold of is Jesus. And from Jesus comes all the other promises that we can read in Scripture and declarations that we can read in Scripture, that we can see as applying to us, that we can embrace and walk in. Every promise that you have ever received, that you have ever been given, is an amen away from actually happening, happening if you will stagger proof your faith. And so this morning, I just wanted to share that with you and say, hey, let's walk in some victory this week. Some of you need healing and God's already spoken healing. Listen, speak healing to your life. Speak directly to your life a word of healing as the Lord gives you that word. Some of you have unsaved loved ones begin declaring the word of the Lord of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. Salvation is coming to their home in the name of Jesus. Why? Because he's already said it would happen and my amen must line up with his yes. You got situations at home speaking over your husband, speaking over your children, speaking over your wife speaking over your job, all of those things begin to speak the promises of God. It's not just, uh, uh, well, it's, it's, it's not a complicated thing. We make it complicated. Christianity is a tough road to, to walk down. It's a tough journey, but it's also a burdenless journey when we truly rely upon Jesus and let the promise that we are resting on rest on grace that empowers us to see the promise that we're resting on happen. Listen, God is so good and he has given us everything that we need that pertains to life and godliness. And I am so thankful for everything that he is doing for me, that he's doing for you, that he's doing for our church, that he's doing in our lives as a church together, that he's doing for our community and in, and in the other churches in our community and the churches in our nation, the churches in the world. Listen, I am, I, I am ecstatic to see what God is going to do in the last days. But I know if we don't have a stagger proof faith, we're not going to make it. So I challenge you today, stagger proof your faith. Start with the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus and let that become the framework through which all other promises become yes, because they already are yes, and your amen catches up to it. Amen. Let's pray this morning. Father, we love you, and I thank you so much for your word, and I thank you so much, Lord, for the promise that you have given us that is yes, and, and Lord, that my amen is meeting with that yes. And I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for the foundation of faith that is found in him, that he is the author and the completer of my faith. And I thank you, Lord, for the avenue of faith to be to trickle down to me through Abraham, Lord God. And Father, I, I, just, I just bless your name this morning, Lord, and I thank you that today, uh, 
uh, Lord, that today sparks a new day in my life, a new day in, in the lives of those who are watching this morning and in the lives of those who may watch in the days to come, Lord God, that I, I, I just thank you that a new day is coming, that a new bold declaration is coming, that their amen and my amen is meeting up with your yes, and we are moving forward together in the mighty character and flawless appearance of Jesus, my King. Amen. God bless you guys. You know I love you. I cherish you. And I look forward to two speedy weeks. It'll be no time before we are back together. I love you guys. Have a blessed, blessed day.